also used to be a purist, if you will. Everything has to line up just right. I don't shoot birds that aren't pointed. I'm not picking, do, do you, but you gotta check 10 or 15 things off the list before you can determine if the bird's shootable. It's all around developing a dog and my hat's off to you, but in the in the guiding position, I was forced out of that mindset. I was like, well, they made a mistake there. I watched them push that bird out, but it got shot and they ran over and picked it up, brought it back to me. As long as they're doing it within a forgivable zone, they get a lot of experiences. And the thing about it is how we develop our program is to teach dogs respect for birds and exposure alone will do that unless they're rewarded for doing it wrong. And yes, they got to go make that retrieve, but they aren't catching them. So they try and get sneakier and that sneakier turns into pointing. Um, there are times that I'll run two complete greenhorns together or one greenhorn by itself, but I pick the highest probability areas. Like this is an area where I think we're going to see a lot of birds through here. That's where I put a young dog. And a lot of people are like, oh, this is an area that there could be a lot of birds. Well, I'll leave my dog at the truck because I don't trust them. And I think that that's the way that people view young dogs, right? Like, I don't want the young dog to screw this up. Well, the young dog needs the experience. And then where we're going to need somebody that knows what they're doing, that's when we need the old dogs out there. everybody please welcome back onto the show onto the show ethan pippett standing stone kennels how you doing buddy i'm doing good how about yourself i'm doing good just trying to keep my head above water as usual it's uh been a while since you and i got to check in and i know uh as we're recording this you know this is actually the week leading up to pheasant fest so we'll actually be seeing each other here in a couple days but uh you know, since we haven't checked in a while, man, how, how you been? How was hunting season? We didn't get a chance to link up this season, unfortunately. But uh, overall, how was the hunting season for you? Uh, man, first of all, looking forward to Pheasant Fest. We will be there. We'll be at the DT Systems booth, uh, which is actually right next door to the Yukonuba booth. Yeah. So um, all of the great things all in one place think kent is also there which is exciting um i haven't got to i haven't got to meet up with those guys either but um we will be there and by we i mean me and hex are coming cat unfortunately does not get to come this time she is going to be at the ranch el tesoro judging a the first navda event for the San. i'm gonna screw it up it's a new <laughs> chapter i think it's the san antonio chapter but i don't know all right. It's the South Texas something or other chapter that's brand new, which is why I don't know what it's even called. Is, so, it, is the chapter um, pretty much housed on that ranch down there, or are they just testing and using it for the grounds for the test? They are using the grounds there for the test for sure, but um, the regular training grounds, no. So I know um, Charles has kind of been a big part of that, and that might be something cool to talk with him about. But um, the new chapter – Cat's going down there to judge, so she will not be at Pheasant mm. Fest. But yeah, well, Charles spreading the love on uh, on Navda everywhere. I'm, you know, it's hard to believe that, <laughs> <laughs> right? He's probably it's, one of the uh, loudest Navda spokesmen in the country. <laughs> uh, right now, I do believe. Yes, right now, I, I he is a like secretary or assistant of some sort from an organizational standpoint in so many different chapters. It is insane, but. You need volunteers. You need people that know what they're doing, right? I mean, right. that makes a huge difference in, in keeping things organized. So um, outside of that, hunting season was a lot of fun. Uh, South Dakota grouse numbers are up. That was fun early season. Um, we even shot quite a few of them during pheasant season. I ran most of the season guiding there. Um, bird numbers were down a little bit. We... We shot closer to that two birds a guy, only a couple limit days. Um, but it was weird because they were all spread out more. So you kept active all day. You were in birds all day. It wasn't, but it wasn't big, big, big groups getting out mm. of pockets. And that usually is just a, a visual thing anyway. You just watch them all fly away. <laughs> right. And shoot a couple, right. So it's, um, but. Outside of that, we still had a really successful season, had a couple new groups come up, which was fun. It's always fun to see 
the same faces, but it's also fun to to help new faces experience the 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 thing that you love so much. Yeah. So after that, man, um, I spent a good amount of time going back and forth to the ranch. I didn't hunt a ton outside of a couple short trips here in Kansas. Um, I actually did a little guiding down at the the ranch this year as well, which was just to help out a, an extra large group. Um, and then we rolled into January and, and I started going to pigeon races. So <laughs> got, got that pigeon nerd brain going. <laughs> oh buddy. Yeah. Oh buddy. So I, it was a, it was a really good season. Stayed busy September, October, November, and part of December. So. Nice. Nice. Well, to, to circle back on some of the comments you, you spoke about in the South Dakota numbers, you getting into some of the sharp tail grouse or prairie chickens in South Dakota later in the season during pheasant hunting, you hear all the time about how skittish some of those birds get after months of pressure. Uh, Absolutely. You know, how typical is that, that you just, you know, get some bycatch when you're pheasant hunting out there? It doesn't seem like it's too, too common, but it sounds like you guys got into them this year. Yeah, typically not. It's, uh, it's grown year after year after year. Um, that I, th- I think the, the first year that I went up there, which was almost 13 years ago now, uh, at least 12 years ago now, the, I think we saw one group or maybe didn't even see any the first year that I was up there. I didn't even know. And then as the years have progressed, it's been like, Oh, grouse hunting. Like, okay, well, what is grouse hunting? People are like, Oh, we, well, we get up real early and we go sit on a fence line and stand by a hay bale. And then we shoot them as they come over. And I was like, that doesn't sound like any fun at all. <laughs> and then I figured out that you can chase them with dogs and that's a lot more fun. And it's kind of a season extender, if you will, from a more traditional pheasant hunter. That's what I did a majority of. And now we can start hunting in September. And that's taken me in a, to a lot of different states. We just tend to kind of hang out in South Dakota because I have a place to stay and it's eight hours closer than where I could start hunting in Montana and a bunch of, a bunch of different things like that. And we've been successful. If we were in that area and didn't find any birds, I would move on or stop hunting. them. Yeah. But, um, it's been, it's been good. I think every single group this year that I took pheasant hunting killed grouse during pheasant season. So wow. that's third Saturday in October through, I was up there through like the 16th of November was the latest date. And the last group, we shot the most. Um, it was a kind of kind of a freak deal. They're in bigger groups that time of year, and we had a little hot day. Yeah. I don't know, and so they were kind of spread out along this deal. And man, they just got up one or two at a time in front of the and flew the whole line. You know, it's like y'all are supposed to be smart. And, uh, <laughs> they didn't show it that day, but it's it's been good it's it's fun too because it adds a little variety guys typically come up there just to shoot pheasants and now they're having to really think about what gets up from a differentiation standpoint yeah i would say nine out of every 10 grouse that get up with our typical pheasant hunters gets called a hen and and let fly yeah so the fact that there's enough of them that i'm being able to help these guys recognize and and kill the right birds is it's pretty cool. Well, and that, that raises a good point. You know, it takes a while to develop that eye, to be able to call hen or sharp tail getting up that quick. And before, you know, the bird obviously gets out of shooting range, you know, especially uh-huh. if, if you're if you're foreign to both, if you're brand new to just upland hunting in general, it really, it, you're just watching birds fly away unnecessarily sometimes. And uh, it's hard to, it's kind of like you can't really direct people on how to figure that out. It's just kind of like repetitions. You just got to go and, and see enough of them before you start having confidence in your eye. This is 100% the case, but even quote-unquote veterans make the mistake. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, me specifically, we were in an area early season, and it was uh, we had seen one small group of pheasants, like two or three hens and a rooster got up, and – then it was sort of later in another field and I'm walking right down this fence line and two, I like stepped on them. That's how close they were. And they got up. Now I'll here, here's my little excuse, right? Um, they kind of flew toward the sun. 
So mm. at first glance, they were dark, but I was like, oh, those are pheasants. And then I was like, no, they aren't. You know, <laughs> it, you can, when they get out far enough, you can see wing beat completely changes and everything. When they first get up, they flap pretty hard. So I made the mistake and I literally stepped on the bird. You know, mm. so it's it, anybody, it can still happen to. Um, but it's one of those things that it takes, it takes numbers. It takes time out there looking at them. And most of the time when you're hunting, you're in an area where there's grouse or you're in an area where there's pheasants. There's not a ton of changeover or crossover, but sometimes there is. Yeah. And and takes experience. You know, I haven't really been fortunate enough to hunt prairie grouse in the later season. So I just kind of know it through other people or kind of to your point, you just stumble upon them when you are hunting pheasant or something. And it's just, oh, where did you come from? But usually from what most people kind of tell me in my experience is the more pressure these sharp tails and prairie chickens get, it's kind of like, man, they usually aren't letting you get that close to them later in the season. And to your point, the weather conditions and kind of winter taking a little while to to really kind of freeze up and get cold and winter conditions this year, I'm wondering how much of an impact that had to it afforded you the opportunity to get that close. Because usually it's like you crest a hill and they're already ditching out over the following hill and you're just kind of doing this crazy chase down the down the prairie and you're never getting close enough to even take a poke at them. Yeah, it's um, I, I would agree with you. That is drastically more typical. And I think that it comes down to the numbers, you know, as the, the season goes on, they get in bigger groups and there's always one watching and yeah. that one spots that, you. That sentinel before. bird. <laughs> yeah. And it, we, we were, we were walking through an alfalfa field and I was like, they're normally kind of just up over this edge. And that, uh, I'm like, what is that on the hay bale? Oh yeah. Sharp tail. There they go. <laughs> you know? So had, had the sentinel bird not been up there, had he fallen us asleep on the job, we'd have had a much better shot. But, yeah. Um, so you see things like that. But most of the time when we see the prairie grouse in pheasant season, they are, they're not in the grass. They are um, in the field. They're out eating grain, um, either milo or corn or something to that effect. And you'll catch them right on the edge, like a transition zone between some grouse. Now, prairie chicken specifically which is more what we actually shoot where we're pheasant hunting than than sharp tail um they're okay with a little bit of the grass we see them but again it's usually within 15 or 20 yards of the edge of the grain field that they're picking and they just kind of crawl out and um i think it's because of the amount of alfalfa that's mixed in with the like the grasses that we right that we hunt so. yeah no I, I would uh Echo pretty much your experience on that prairie chickens. I can usually find a little bit more in the grassy type areas, but you know, and they will hang out adjacent to the ag, but the sharp tails seem to be a little more attached to the ag, generally speaking. And, uh, it's interesting, you know, you, you referred to yourself as pr primarily a pheasant hunter over the years. That's kind of what took you out there. And then you just kind of sure. fell into the prairie grouse thing. In your opinion, like what are the main differences in how a pheasants act and what you want out of a dog as opposed to the prairie grouse? Do you have, do you really change up your approach or how you run your dogs at all based on if you're chasing one or the other on any given day? Yeah, that's good. Um, I, the last, the last little tidbit that I just that just hit me is we usually find them in shelter belts. So they're again shelter belts along the edge of ag, um, and that's where we'll see more sharp tail than uh, prairie chickens. But all of that being said, those are the two the two places. Now, as far as hunting the dogs, different. I think that um, for me in general, I'm more of a hands off handler when it's possible. Now, when we're guiding hunts. I, I don't have the luxury of that. I have to keep dogs a little closer so that they don't make mistakes or they make uh, mistakes that can be fixed by them happening close enough for somebody to shoot a bird. Um, but I try and keep dogs closer so that people that are paying me to take them hunting aren't like, look, your dog pushed that bird. Out. And <laughs> right. Where when I'm grouse hunting, I don't guide grouse hunts. So I let the dogs run a little bit more typically it's kind of like a place to cut teeth and 
the young dogs are out there and they do make mistakes, but we typically find enough ground that if the birds fly a good ways over there, we can get back to them somehow. So it's, um, it's one of those things that I allow dogs to adjust naturally. And if I were pheasant hunting myself, I do a lot less handling. So all that being said, I'd say pheasant dogs do typically stay a little closer. And that's just because um, the cover that we're hunting is a lot thicker. They have to stay closer or by design, they're closer because they have to work more diligently through the cover that they're in, where when you are hunting prairie grouse, the cover is light and thin for the most part, and they can cruise that a little bigger. And sometimes it's nice for them to kind of run down the, the little ravine and up the other side and make a loop across top of the hill and go, well, I'm glad I didn't have to walk 200 yards over there to check that or or whatever. Yeah. So, um, I let those dogs run a little bigger, um, uh, early season. Yeah. And I mean, again, <clears throat> early, early dogs, young dogs, maybe it's their first season. Prairie grouse. I love prairie grouse for young dogs, figuring it out, just, just running and hitting scent and learning the bird manners and all that. Pheasants can be a little tricky, even on some experienced dogs, especially you get into some of those thick cattail sloughs or something like that, and they're just running and they don't seem to stop running. It seems like I'm hearing more, more and more people every year talking about how they don't even want their dogs to get on pheasants in the first year. Like they're just going to hold them back on pheasants until the second or third year. And judging by your face, like I'm, uh, you know, <laughs> I was about to say, what, how much stock do you put into that? Do you think there's any kind of ground to that? Oh, see, I've used pheasants for so many years to teach dogs how to hunt wild birds that I think that wild birds are important, period. Um, I The thing that I would caution, and, and I have the luxury of having access to it um, and make that a thing that I go and guide. I couldn't get on as many birds as we get on if I was hunting for myself every day. A, I can only shoot three, or if I've got a buddy with me, you know, we can only handle a handful versus an eight or, you know, six, eight, 10 man limit in a day, which we haven't been shooting limits, but we still are, are averaging 20 plus birds a day. So that's, and that adds up more. quick. Yeah. Yes. It's a lot more. Um, these last two seasons, bird numbers have been, our harvest numbers have been down a little bit, but even just three years ago, we killed almost 700 roosters mm. in the season that I was up there. You know, I mean, it's, um, so I also used to be a purist, if you will. And I think that that would be more the direction that the people making the comments, like they want their dogs to stay away from pheasants would be that they want their dogs to do everything perfect and everything has to line up just right. I don't shoot birds that aren't pointed. I don't do this. You know, like you've got to check and I'm not picking do, do you, but you've got to check 10 or 15 things off the list before you can determine if the bird's shootable or not. Right. And it's all around developing a dog and my hat's off to you. But again, in the, in the guiding position, I was forced out of that mindset. It was like, well, they made a mistake there. I watched them push that bird out, but it got shot and they ran over and picked it up, brought it back to me. And as long as they're doing it within a um, forgivable zone, if you will, which is, they're not too far ahead. They get a lot of ex experiences. And the thing about it is they almost never, in some big snowstorms, I've actually seen a couple dogs dig birds out of the snow, but almost never can they catch one of those birds. So by design, which is how we utilize bird launchers and how we, we're going to get into the spring training aspect of things, but how we develop our program is to teach dogs respect for birds and exposure alone will do that unless they're rewarded for doing it wrong and yes they got to go make that retrieve but they aren't catching them so they try and get sneakier and that sneakier turns into um pointing it's just yeah it's just how it works right and ultimately you're kind of describing a lot of my outlook on how I've handled dogs in the past. And it seems like every year I'm going, I'm, I'm loosening up just more and more and more. I'm not really guiding, but I'm seeing to your point, if you kind of think of it in a dog's brain, the, the reinforcer, what is the reinforcer here? If they're not catching the birds, it's not that big of a deal, right? But you do have some dogs that 
they just love to chase. They just love a flying bird, right? And so for a dog like that, that might impact that specific dog more so than maybe your normal one that as long as it's not getting rewarded by you or catching the bird, it's probably not going to stick out in their head nearly as much as what it would for that dog that just loves seeing and chasing flying birds. Yeah, and so when I when I look at it and I talk about it and I think about it, that's the way that I would have been initially is like, I, these dogs can't get rewarded for these mistakes they're making. And then just because I have typically young dogs work well up there, if they have a good handle on them. And these are dogs that point birds in, in training fields and have had birds killed over them and a good number of things, but they're not by any means finished. They're in there. This will be their first season. That's primarily what I guide with. And um, with an occasional older dog to kind of pick up some slack here and there. But these young dogs will go from basically they're just with us to after seven to ten days of hunting, they're now leading the pack, per se, of pointing, and they they don't get a ton of backing opportunities with the, the volume of cover that we're in, but um, pointing their own birds, helping digging out cripples and retrieving and and – all of those pieces just build up the experience category and we're not there long enough though. There's a lot happening in a short period of time. We're not there long enough that this is like a lifetime expectation that you get to push birds out and make mistakes. We go back and we train in the off season to, to better them for the next yeah. year. But well, and the experience uh, is unmatchable. Yeah. So, well, and with those young dogs, I would argue, especially with some of the dogs that we're seeing on the landscape of people trying to do too much too fast with their dogs. Maybe they're trying to put a level of steadiness or control on their dog that would be more advisable to hold off a year or two going out. And after a week or in your case, multiple weeks chasing these wild birds, even if they are bumping birds and stuff like that it's only going to help build that drive and that desire to hunt to where they they just hate birds in all the right ways. Right. You know, we've all seen the dogs in there to where it's like, genetically speaking, they have all the, the actual skills somewhere in there, but it's just like, we haven't really developed and brought the drive out in them the correct way as the handlers. And so to your point, just taking your young dogs out there, they're going to figure it out. The more reps and experience they get on these wild birds. Yeah, have have realistic expectations, but don't be don't be too hard on them. I mm-hmm. mean, they are they are babies out there running around. And now, if you're talking about your four year old that's running and bumping birds, we've we've missed something <laughs> right. The way yeah, that you know, if it happens once, sure, that's it's part of it. But if it's every time, then we've we've missed the bar. And we're talking about young first season dogs. Um, and they need as much exposure as possible. I believe very heavily in the fact that um, experience is the is the marker for when we can move forward. It's not, again, years. So one of these dogs that comes out of hunting with me for a season, I mean, realistically, in all of those birds, they may have 100 to 150 wild bird contacts um, divided up against all the dogs you know or i'm talking shoot i could i don't journal i don't do a lot of people journal and document and do all of that and i don't personally do it so to it ends up being just a, a guesstimate but i mean i think we went on a couple trips with some bigger slightly bigger groups five six guys for grouse hunting and there were a lot of days that we shot limits and we went to north dakota and we went um uh, we spent a little bit of time in montana some in um, south dakota even some into nebraska um but we shot a lot of grouse and i took the same string of basically eight young dogs with me everywhere then we come into pheasant season we averaged i think probably 19 birds a day uh roughly and i hunted 15 or 20 hunting days so um you're still in the 500 plus pheasant category Mm -hmm. um it's a lot it's a lot of birds that they saw and the the dogs in the beginning i mean they had no idea what they were doing they never smelled the grouse never smelled the pheasant and 
there's one dog in in particular i don't know if you ever heard we don't didn't talk about it a lot i don't think um that you might have heard um i had a dog break his neck about two years ago Hmm. so yeah i don't recall that okay so scary deal um he's young and a hard charger like out outran his ability a lot of times not overrunning birds or any of that kind of thing i'm just like everything he did he did with 120 percent but he really only had the ability to run that 95 percent you know Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i don't know just a little clumsy for a puppy and just no fear if there was a gap he didn't even stop to judge it he just tried (laughs) to jump it right and that's ultimately what got him hurt he he went and he but in this situation he just missed it was a washout in a training field and he's just hauling butt trying to keep catch up to another dog or something um and he hit that washout and his front end went down and his head just Oof. right into the other bank and uh he kind of let out a cry but then was just stunned and couldn't move he's kind of like twitchy i thought for sure he was dead i mean or mm. or we're going to have to take him to the vet it was instantly um it's very very scary take him into the vet they put him on extremely high doses of uh, steroids for the anti-inflammatory, including, I think, a shot of steroids to start off with. But just he was on steroids for a long time to keep the swelling down and and basically bed rest for, I think, eight full weeks maybe. Oh, man, that's miserable for a dog like that. I mean, any dog, oh, but yes. a dog that's, that's hard charging, I, that, I can yes. imagine how big a pain that was. <laughs> oh, man. And... And ultimately, he came out of it. He's completely recovered. Like, I do believe that he, he has a slight deviation in his neck where it goes, it comes out just slightly different. If you're but looking for it, maybe you can see it. Correct. Okay. Correct. But outside of that, he's made a, a full recovery. And um, But because of that, it happened leading right into hunting season. He missed his first season. And I think that's a very important it's at a very important time in their life. They're impressionable. They're looking to learn. They're malleable at that time. Like that's all they say. Get start. You can't teach old dogs new tricks. You can. It's just harder. Right. And he, so he missed it. He missed all of it because that was the the peak of his recovery time. It happened in a conditioning session right before. I think it happened in September. So then it might have been twelve full weeks. I don't know. It was forever. He was on bed rest and then we're coming in the tail end of stuff and he doesn't know anything. And then we didn't have very many trips. And so here we are season two and all he's doing is running around playing, chase the other dogs. If you shoot, he runs over and picks up a shotgun shell and chews on it and carries it around. You know, like he, he found every single shotgun shell he's a good <laughs> citizen that way. Every single shotgun shell we dropped in the field but he knew absolutely nothing, nothing. And though, I mean, you put a bird out in a controlled environment, he run over there and point it. He knows how to do the things, but he knows nothing about what we're doing out there. So we go through this season and he hunts all the grouse hunt days with me. And then he hunts all the pheasant hunt days with me. And I'm, I'm talking, he's picked up a couple birds that were shot, but he's just running around and he, he will sniff out and find a shotgun shell um and then run around is he just a screwball right not he doesn't have any idea and then it clicked and the last group that i was up there with he won shelter bell i was like this is a good spot for him he he listens well he stays he'll be in he pointed like 10 or 12 birds in that one deal just boom 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 all the way down pinned them all down and from that, and that was the first day on the last group. Then the second day and the third day after that, I mean, he moved from dead last in the truck to competing for first, second category as far as um, focus and understanding of the task, which is the switch you would expect out of an older dog to pick up faster. But it was, it was crazy, you know, to see that. And all he was given was exposure. I didn't try and do anything different with him or handle him into anything or just, just he was on the ground doing nothing but causing no problems. 
and then moved into a category of once it clicked, it, it was there. So it's just a, an example of how important the wild bird exposure is. And qual let's call it, let's call it quality bird exposure. Um, and what I mean by quality bird exposure is a preserve that puts out birds properly, which is not 10 birds dizzied in a line of a food plot and you got to kick each one of them to get them out of the food plot. If you're going to a preserve and you're having 20 birds put out, just ask them to fly them out of the box for you and then expect to find 10 of them and go hunt and have fun. And those are good birds for your dogs to work on. They're way better than a dizzy bird that's tossed into something. So you need quality bird experience. And, and then he got the opportunity. We did one later hunt up here. He came out and hunted for, you might have seen it. We did a, a DT systems hunt video, kind of finishing out Hex's series. It was a Kansas pheasant hunt. Um, he came on that deal. And that's a place down by Greensboro, Kansas. Um, what is the name of it? I'll think of it before we get done here. But it's um, half wild because I saw birds like that and definitely put birds out the morning of. So they do different things, but we saw birds that got up 100 and something yards ahead of us and flew into the next, you know, flew across the road in the next field. So there was um, some quality birds and some dumber birds but overall it was a really good experience for the dogs too yeah. so finding places like that if it's an option are good but then as many wild bird chances as you can and it's it's hard if it's a second dog it's easier to hunt the the dog that knows everything and you can trust them but that young dog's got to be on the ground yeah i mean it goes back to what you're wanting to get out of the trip, right? Like what's the purpose of sure. you going out? Do you, uh, if your purpose is to kill birds and you have that older dog in the truck and you have the one day a month that you get a chance to do that, it's hard. Not, it's, it's hard not to put that dog down in favor of the novice, right? The, the brand new dog, but you're never going to develop that brand new dog by not putting them down. What's your thought process on running younger dogs with older dogs? How much do you think that younger dogs picking up from that older dog? Yeah, two, two parts to that. So my philosophy is that everything in dog training is good in moderation. So, um, but too much of anything is bad. So you can run them with an adult dog. It's fantastic. All, most of our young dogs are running with some level of more experienced dog than them. And um, there are times that I'll run two complete greenhorns together or one greenhorn by itself, but I pick the highest um, uh, probability areas. Like this is an area where typically it's a short walk. I know we're going to see, I think we're going to see a lot of birds through here. That's where I put a young dog. Um, and a lot of people, I even guys that come with me, they're like, oh, this is an area that there could be a lot of birds. Well, I'll leave my dog at the truck because they don't trust them or something to that effect. And I think that that's the way that people view young dogs, right? Like, I don't want the young dog to screw this up. Well, the young dog needs the experience. And then where we're going to need somebody that knows what they're doing to work the ground, that's when we need the old dogs out there. So yeah. When you go get the expert, that's when you have the challenge ahead, right? You need the one with the Correct. experience to, to have success, but it is, man, it's tough when you know this one's going to house some birds and you just know you got that, you know, the ace in the truck that's just, you're going to go out there and just have one of those banner days. But again, if you, if you have a younger dog to develop, that's how you develop them because it does go back to quality bird exposure. And that kind of goes into the training overall that we're going to get into is hunting season's wrapped up. Now everybody's kind of figuring out what they're going to do for the year and spring and, and what skills are we going to develop and, and what, how are we going to build off of what we did last year in this hunting season? Maybe we just got all that, that experience we just talked about. And to me, you know, the quality bird exposure you know, as we go in and we develop our plans, there's kind of two ways to look at this. In my opinion, you have your overall kind of seasonal plan. What do you hope to get out of before next hunting season? But then also yeah. you need to kind of have a daily plan. And of course that can adjust day to day, but when you're making your plan, you need to have that quality bird exposure. You need to have the, the correct setup to teach what you're actually hoping for. So 
but before we even get into that, we need to establish like what, how do you, what's the best, yeah, if I can talk, what is the best advice you can give somebody to set up their training plan so that it is realistic and, and in my opinion, just more importantly, attainable based on their dogs and, and what they're hoping to get out of them? Um, for me, I try and look very honestly at what I saw throughout the last season and looking at things objectively is, is easier for me as a professional or as somebody that's got a lot of experience with multiple dogs. It's really easy if you have a dog or just two dogs to look at them through, how do they say, rose-colored glasses, right? Everything looks better through rose-colored glasses. I, so they say. Uh, <laughs> right. Shock, uh, clay pigeons do, though, right? Like They use like a rosy color. <laughs> yeah, they have different color. colors. for diff- I think it depends on like ultimately the exposure of the sun. Like if it's a real sunny day, uh-huh. you want you want a certain lens and then if it's real cloudy you want the green one i don't know where the rose colored one comes into play i don't i don't know <laughs> maybe it's just song lyrics or something but um all of that being said you need to be able to be honest and say my dog was good at x y and z write it down and but i'd like to see them get to here whatever that whatever that new step is so let's say this first season they pointed birds they weren't quite as steady as you would have liked there were some times that you saw them you know maybe creep in or push birds out as you were approaching but they pointed them until you got within gun range and you were successful and then they picked them up and they kind of farted around with retrieves brought them most of the way back sometimes dropped them sometimes didn't you know look at some of those things or if they were phenomenal retrievers but weren't as good at pointing or really good at pointing and didn't retrieve at all um you know, being able to be honest about what you saw this last season and and then look into where do we want to go. And that's also different for everybody. You know, when we look at stuff, we're always moving toward the direction of the highest level of advanced testing and titling. And we'll probably get into this a little bit later too, but at the ranch, dogs that are going there, which is a good portion of the dogs that we have, all of those dogs hunt quail, um, both pen rays and wild quail, uh, steady wing shot fall. So that is the, the top tier that you can take a versatile dog or a pointing dog to from a steadiness standpoint. And that's our end goal. So all of our dogs are moving with some direction toward that based off of how much experience they had, how mentally prepared they seem for the advanced training and um and and we make a plan based on those things so what experience they have what did they need to improve on and what's the best way to kind of get there it's it takes being honest though and being objective about the process Mm -hmm. yeah honestly that's a that's a tough one because I mean, so many people, they, what are they, they love their dogs. Right. And for some sure. people it's like, they that. just kind of conflate. Like if I'm honest and maybe I'm acknowledging the shortcomings, it's almost as if I don't love the dog and, and it's just not true. I mean, how do you expect to get anything better if you don't recognize where you have room for improvement? Uh, but more often than not, like I see a lot of people to where, okay, we're telling somebody to be honest. Well, if you're brand new to this and you're, this is your first, year or the second year in this case where we're talking about you know uh after the first hunting season for a young dog maybe they just don't know what to be honest about right and and i think you know this is where a lot of people can kind of go astray and and if you're looking at social media and you know looking at all this and taking a bunch of advice you know that's where it's just like i I would advise find a, a trainer near you that you know and trust or or you know want to you respect their opinion, go get their opinion and let them kind of guide you until you have enough knowledge to really understand what it is that you don't know. You know, we have to know what we don't know to ask the right questions. It's extremely valid. It's, it's one of those things that when people come and watch the puppies, even they're like, wow, that's the best dog I've ever seen. And like, well, this is just a puppy. (laughs) It doesn't know anything, you know, like it's so you're hundred percent right in that. But um, I think that we mentioned Navda at kind of the beginning of this call, but uh, Navda is a great resource 
um, AKC dog clubs also. They're probably slightly less of a good resource because they don't do – not very many AKC clubs I found do training days and things like that. It's just like the club helps host a, an event. Yeah. Um, but NABDA has a lot of training days, and you can – you got to be careful a little bit, and I say this. Everybody there will have an opinion, so you do need to find those people that you trust, but that's a good resource to find people that you want to um, to be able to spend more time with as well as experience higher levels of training and say, do I want this or do I not need this? Yeah. And um, because that, that high level of steadiness takes maintenance and it is work. There are dogs out there that can do it, but there are very few dogs that are extremely naturally steady to that high level and don't require maintenance and also love to retrieve so mm. it, if you have, you know, we used to run uh, a handful of pointers and English, po- English pointers to be specific. And those dogs love to stand. And that's kind of more what they're bred for. And teaching them steadiness was easy. Getting them to stand steady and not be needing any maintenance to that really was fairly easy comparatively to the other end of the spectrum which is a dog that wants to go get that bird yeah and most of the versatile breeds are going to be in some some vein of that really high level of drive and desire to go catch whatever they've got once it's shot and retrieve so and i mean it makes a whole lot of sense when you kind of think about it just you know which one's more prone to prioritize catching that bird or not you know obviously if you got a real pointy dog then you know we're not saying that they can't retrieve or that you can't build the retrieve but we're just saying naturally uh what they're more prone to do or wanting to do how do we advise people to balance what's best for the dog progression on a timeline wise as opposed to our ambition and what i mean by that like you know we as handlers or owners we might be sitting here, it's February now, March when this comes out, and we're eyeing a test. You know, let's just stick with the NAVDA test, a utility test at the, you know, this early fall. And so we put that on the calendar. And we all know these tests fill up really fast. So you can't really blame people for getting the slot that they need to. And then yeah. it's kind of like you have some people that will, they don't have a problem pulling to just go next year and we'll test again next year. But you do have some people that, we're signed up for this test, hell or high water, we're going to test that dog, right? And they might be trying to force a a square peg into a round hole when if they just kind of wait and and go back to the pace of the dog, in the long run, they're going to be happier with the results and maybe they're not taking something away from it. How do we kind of balance that or help people figure out how to balance that? It. It is tough. Um, I will say that timelines are dog trainer's worst enemy. So not that you shouldn't have a direction in which you're traveling, but you need to do it at that dog's pace, and that takes experience. Um, But it also just takes listening to the dog. Um, If you're struggling to make progress, maybe reevaluate the process or the the way you're approaching. Um, Sometimes we look at growth. Um, I try and explain growth to people when we talk about training and how dogs grow, because it seems to fit really well. Um, A good parallel would be muscle growth. So when you start training a muscle, um, you work it hard enough to see growth, and that requires uh, work enough that you feel a little sore and, and things like that happen. If you don't work the muscle enough, if you don't stress it enough, um, you're never going to see growth or you see very, very, very minimal, very slow growth. Uh, if you stress at the right amount, then you're going to see optimal growth. If you stress too much, then the muscle breaks and that takes a very long time to heal. Um, in fact, sometimes never heals back properly. You always have a weird thing in your bicep because you, it broke and it's a weird remodel growth area. And so when you're looking at your dogs, you think about it the same way. Um, just because I want to be stronger and I, someday I want to be able to squat 400 pounds. It doesn't mean I can just go out there with 400 pounds and, and then break my back. So, um, 
Now, when you look at that growth category, you think that the, we just talked about the, the stressing of your muscles is going to help you to grow muscles, right? Well, the stressing portion isn't actually the growth portion. It's the, the resting after the stress that allows for the growth to happen, the rebuilding of those muscles. So when you think about dogs, a lot of times more is not better. Sometimes they do need a break. And when you hit a wall, if you give them time off, most of the time, dogs come out of that time off rejuvenated and ready to do it. And it'll almost be like, did you read the book while you were <laughs> taking a week off or something like that? And now you understand what we're doing. Um, it just it is crazy how yeah. much it seems like they can learn in those gap periods. So it is finesse. It is a balance act. And there isn't a magic formula to, to explain in this that's black and white for, um, for dog training. Dog training is, I don't want to say gray zone, but it is a, it's a balance act of doing enough to see the growth, but not doing too much for that individual dog. And every single dog is an individual. So I would say the best thing that we try and do is provide them opportunities and then to listen to what they're doing. If they're excelling and they're doing well, keep on the path that you're at. I mean, if it's right, if, if it's working, it's probably right to, to some degree. Maybe not exactly the way that I would do it, but there's a, a million ways to skin the cat. You, um, you need to be evaluating your dog on the daily. Did this go poorly? Maybe I should try something different. And that's it's why we build the language into how we train dogs. We teach, develop, help. Um, we don't force or break or... Um, command dogs and it's when you take that approach you can look at a situation and say how do I do that so it's a long way around saying how do you judge that it's you're going to need help with it really um, you need to be able to see the pieces we try and show a large variety of different things on our our YouTube channel and we show different dogs working we try and show struggles not all of the videos have struggles and that's not because they're video edited multiple take shots. It's just because as a professional trainer, I make minimal mistakes that allows us to progress fairly quickly where small amounts of timing and things like that could be off in your session and it slow you down. You know, it's, um, but know a direction of where you're going based on what those goals are. So we've already established, you have to have goals. You have to know what you're doing to be able to get to the goals, but then how do we move through those goals? Um, Throw the timeline out the window. Yes, book your spot at the test or the event or the thing, but be 100% okay with throwing that away if you are not close enough to ready to go. So yeah. um, that's, I mean, that's it for me. We we push a lot of dogs off. Like, oh, you're not ready. Let's just run you next yeah. year. I mean, that's a, that's a normal thing. No, I mean, all, all great points and advice. And, you know, it's, you know, there's so many when you get into this space, you know, there's so so many kind of sayings. It's just kind of it paints with a broad stroke because you can't get into the minutia or the details or the context of every single thing or else you're going to be talking for 24 hours on every single question with all this stuff. Because, you know, it's you have to have goals, you have to have a plan and all that stuff. But how how to get to those goals, you're going to kind of create your own day-to-day -day routine almost. And if you're anything like me, the daily routine is the daily routine. Anything that throws you off the routine, it's just kind of, it's, it has like a mental hurdle for me almost like, oh man, I can't believe we broke this mental routine. And if you're brand new starting out and people say, you know, 10 to 15 minutes a day, it's like some days I go out there and I get exactly what I need out of the dogs and I'm done in three minutes. Other days I'm out there. I'm like, all right, I know, you know, you know, it extends beyond the 15 minute mark. And, and so you just kind of have to go with the flow and what the dog's given you and just think on that as a, as a bigger scale. So it's like, you may have the plan for this month. Like, all right, this month it's not overly hot. We can get some good field work. Let's work on steadiness. And then, you know, the next month we're going to do duck search and then whatever, fill in the blanks. But if you don't hit your actual goals, to your point, don't just barrel through it. And it's amazing how just taking 
three, four, five days off from that dog, just one week off. If you're, if you're, if you're really struggling and you're just banging heads with the dog and, and you're, there's kind of just conflict building up between you and the dog because he's just not getting it. And, you know, I, I'm kind of curious as to your thoughts on like, do you really think the break is more for the dog to get their mind in line or the handler to get their mind back in line and maybe just kind of everybody take a break and we come at it, you know, refresh and renewed. Well, there's a, there's a, a number of good, good things to touch on there. Um, I want to say this cause you said it in your, your routine aspect of things like a three minute session might be good or a 15 minute session. I'm going to, I'm going to steal or even more, whatever, whatever the dog needs. Right. Yep. So I'll steal this one from, um, Chad Leonard. This is a guy that you need to talk to. Okay. He's uh, fresh er into the world. He's got a, a good amount of experience. He is a um, a cocker man, a spaniel man, and is running the field trial circuit. He's got some absolutely amazing young dogs, and he currently lives here local. I think they're going to be moving into doing something else here in the future, but um, – he'd reach out to me. And so we started training a little bit together and he said something that really resonated the other day is uh, the way to explain this is when you start a training session, you should be looking for the perfect time to stop. Yeah. And that is how you mark when the session is done. Now experience, right. Is what allows you to get good at that. But that's the best way I've heard it explained. Cause it's always, you don't, I always talk about don't be a greedy trainer and take you know, I was like, oh, I'll just get one more. That one was so good. Let's do another one, right? And I fall into that trap a little bit. It, years of dog training has is, is taught me how it's very much not helpful to get sucked into the greedy training category. But he explained it as, when I start a training session, I'm always looking for the perfect place to stop. And if you're looking at that going, wow, that was really good. Let's call that it, rather than, Oh, that was really good. I want to do another one. Uh, it, it, it helps to find out. And you also have to understand it's okay for that to be two or three minutes. You got a little piece in there that was good, and you can do a little piece tomorrow that's good and a little piece tomorrow that's good instead of some good stuff, then it got bad, then we had to try and work back through that. Now we've got some different feelings <laughs> mixed in with the whole process. Um, now, as far as the break category, uh, I would say that no, knowing myself and training dogs, I see the, the benefit is extremely beneficial for the dog. Now, I also, through um, Patreon, we have our, our deal set up for helping people with dog training, and you can set up a subscription there to have me join you in training sessions once a week, once every other week, and... Um, it's really beneficial for people going through formal retrieving work, the table work aspect of things. Me being there to guide you once a week helps so much because that can be a frustrating process to work through. Um, for those of the that don't necessarily know what I'm talking, I steer clear of words like force. Um, we talked about this just a minute ago. So force, fetch, our process is similar and you're going to end up with a similar end goal, but it's more of a conditioning process or a teaching process. And um, so I've just kind of, I just have moved into calling it formal retrieving work because there's a lot of pieces that move into that that are not just table involved. They're not just, but when we move into formal retrieving work, our end goal is collar condition to retrieve to hand and then picking multiple marks and things like that. So it's, um, but we are set up to help guide people. And I see, insane amounts of frustration watching people attempt to work through things and it's like I, I get it I'm watching I'm seeing what's happening and I know that it could go better if I was there to step in and do it for you and I see these struggles and in in those situations 100% it's good for both people to clear their mind you know both parties to clear their mind the dog and the handler but um, you've got to have a, a clear head to approach training situations especially challenging ones so um but that that time gap is is very very important yeah so i would say goes both ways yeah no I, and 
It is challenging, especially when you're brand new, getting those reps to where you start trusting your gut is ultimately what you're talking about is trusting sure. your instinct, your, your intuition with this is you have to develop the reps. And, and that's why I kind of say that everybody's first dog is, is the beat up dogs. Like nobody's first dog ends up being the dog that they potentially should have been right. Like it's just, sure. it is what it is. Every dog should get better theoretically you know everyone's different genetic wise but uh theoretically your skills as a trainer should get better every time and so when you start noticing your gut instinct you know there's gonna be a couple times where to your point oh we should we should wrap this up that was perfect i want to get one more well learn from that experience when you go down that decline and and all of a sudden you're going downhill, the dog's getting hot and you're just trying to get that one more good rep on that table so you can end the whole thing. And it's just the wheels are coming off. Learn from that experience. Don't just go out there the next day and do the exact same thing and be like, ah, here we are again. It's just like, no, just err on the correct side and, and be okay with the fact that you went out there with a 15 minute plan and you only needed two or three minutes. You know what? Go do a fun run for the next 12 minutes if it makes you happy, right? You know, finish it on a good note that way. Uh, because once you go down that spiral, it is, <laughs> it's hard to put the wheels back on that train. Uh, yeah, hard. Basically, it's basically impossible. You never... I'm not going to say never. There are not absolutes, but I have been in that boat and rarely have I made it past the zone where I should have stopped. Like we have peaked and we kind of just try and crawl back to somewhere near the peak, not at it again. Yeah. And so y you do, you have to be good at that. Now, my, my challenge and recommendation is to film every training session that is physically possible to do that. Go back and watch it. Anybody that is listening to your podcast probably also watches YouTube videos of some sort, whether it's ours or anybody others out there, anybody else with videos out there. You get good at watching people do things right or mostly right. And with that experience, it will be easy for you to pick up most of the time it is. It would be fairly easy for you to pick up your own mistakes and become aware of them and help you to avoid them. So, um, video every session and then you can look back and go whoa this video was 30 minutes long i didn't think i was training for that long or i see right there where we had this really good rep and then we slid down the hill and i mean we never really got back there and the dog got hot and tired and i got frustrated and you apply all those things i am a human though i have all the experience in the world there are still times where i get frustrated but what i have is the experience to know we aren't going to make any progress. I need to stop or this is the zone and then how to approach things moving forward. Okay. I've got a dog that's going to, it's going to push back in whatever X, Y, or Z zone. Okay. So we're going to do small, easy reps so that we can kind of build up and necessarily build rapport. And then there are times when you get into what we were talking about, the, the advanced end of the spectrum, there, there comes a time where, you have to have a dog that is consistent enough to do all of this thing, all of these things the first time you ask, basically automatically, and you have zero access to e-collars or electronic training tools, period. So they have to be very reliable. So they need to, at some point in time, know there really is no other option. Now, it cannot be where you start or you will never get to where you really want to be. Yeah. What about balancing you know, let's face it, the dogs can just, they can get bored with some training, you know, I mean, sure. especially, you know, we're talking about force fetch or, or the formal train to retrieve uh, program, you know, sure. it, it's the dogs can get bored with, with the mundane, the day to day, every time it's the same exact thing. And so can we, how do you, uh, how do you go about balancing out and keeping it fresh and fun for the dogs and handlers? How are we balancing the, the mental stimulus with the physical stimulus and keeping them in shape? You know, force fetch isn't really that demanding physically. So how do we balance that with time spent in the field and running and stuff like that? So from a professional dog training standpoint, that is difficult. We have timelines. I just talked about timelines are a dog trainer's worst friend, worst enemy, whatever. Do not have timelines in your process. Have projected goals 
but they cannot be hard timelines. So the um, from a my personal dog standpoint, it's easy. You have to think less is more most of the time, especially in early development stages, and add variety. So when, you know, don't be – don't think that it's an issue. Let me say it this way. Don't think that it's an issue that you can only work birds once a week or once every other week. You can only go out and do it on the weekend. But at the same time, don't say, oh, this is my only day, so we're going to do 14 different runs on three birds out there. No, just a single day of training is completely fine. My dogs, we can literally walk out the back door and go work on birds. Like our training grounds are right here, and my dogs run – unless I'm actively prepping them for something, they're going to run on birds a handful of times a month maximum. You know, and that's young developing dogs. Or we might cluster those and do like a Saturday, Sunday type thing, do two days in a row, and then they're off for a week or better from a bird exposure standpoint. It's the more variety that you give the dog, the better off you're going to be. So be okay with the fact that you can't, get to do all of the things all of the time and find a balance of today we're going to exercise the next day we're going to work on we we like to say the art of doing nothing you just are going to have to mentally focus on the fact that your job today is to sit still and lay on a dog bed and that's how you develop dogs that can do that it's not by running them 14 miles and then they collapse on a dog that doesn't <laughs> right. teach them <laughs> that doesn't teach them how to be still. That teaches them that they need exercise in order to be still. So, um, but then mixing in working for resources. That's a that's a day to day that if you're on a, in a hurry, working for that bowl of food can be do three reps and finish with kennel in your crate. Here's your dog bowl. I've got to run to town quick. I'll be right back or whatever it may be, or make a full training session out of where they have to work basically for each kibble. Um, those things are very important in a dog's brain being complete. If they don't have jobs, um, they can run into like a chaotic state in their brain and that's where they end up with anxiety or they end up with, they try and apply themselves to some other job and that may be to be attached to you or that might be to dig holes in the floor or chew up the couch or any of those kind of things are what are developed from a dog whose mind does not have the correct or enough direction. So just be okay with the fact that you can't do the, the sexy stuff or the bird work stuff every day. That's not necessary. In fact, it's better to not be able to do it, but be okay with clustering things. So we're going to spend three days in a row or two days in a row working on this. And now we're going to throw that away. We're not going to work on it anymore for a while. Now we're going to work on this for two or three days. And that amount of variety almost seems scatterbrained, <laughs> but right. that's the way that um, dogs are truly going to be able to grow. And then when you come back to what you'd worked on three or four sessions ago, usually it's it's there. So Yeah. It's funny, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I, I can remember thinking so much of what you're describing is when you first get into this, you're like, oh man, if I had the training grounds in my backyard, if I had the birds, if I had the pigeons, it's like, I would be out there every single day. And to your point, it's like, you realize real quick that like the way to really move forward is not doing that every single day. It's kind of almost like it waters the meaning of it down for these dogs in a lot of instances. And to what, you know, let's say that you're working steadiness how much of what we preach and you hear all the trainers that come on this podcast talk about like it's taught in the short grass first, right? It's not always taught out there in the field with launchers or planted birds and full on, you know, shotguns and shooting the sexy stuff that we really want to do and and watch and be a part of. I mean, let's be real. Be honest. It's fun. Yeah, it is fun. That's the fun stuff. Yeah, Yeah. that is. But you know what? Like you can get just as much meaning by doing your positive pigeon drill or maybe if you're training with place boards, you know, 
throwing, you know, bombing them with pigeons on a place board or whatever your approach is, you can get just as much meaning with that. And then also just cleaning up woe based, you know, with your lead work or your check cords or whatever to where you don't even need birds for stuff like that. You know, it's, there's a million different things that you can go around doing that's going to address that. And then, then to your point, so many people talk about, man, just run your dog. You got to run your dog down into the dirt every single day or else it's going to drive you insane. It's like, well, you do that for six months in a row. You just have a really freaking in shape dog over there. That's just, it, you know, you started out having to run for 30 minutes. Now it's taking three hours to, to empty that gas tank out. And it's like the dog is just as neurotic as ever. It can't shut its brain off. And, and we talk about the value of just puppies. We're building that and cultivating that as puppies with the crate training. And it's just, you know, freshen it up. I mean, there are certain things that let's just face it, you know, retrieving and and force fetch. It's a grind. It's a day to day grind. And sometimes we just need a break. You know, if you're mentally discouraged going into the training, being like, Oh man, we got to go do force fetch again. You know, if you're feeling that, in my opinion, the dog's going to start picking up on that and feeling it as well. So it's better to just scrap that and go have fun with the dogs and then maybe do a session after that if you're in the mood or just come back the next day. You missing one day is not going to throw that dog off. No, and and in fact, I build those in. So we're talking a lot about this because it's a very challenging part of – the next step for a lot of people, you've made it through this first hunting season. What do we do in the off season here? Well, a lot of times it's the dog is now over eight to 10 month category. Usually this is a bigger mental ask to, to work through the retrieving portion of things this way. And, um, when I help people, I build those times and it's like, you need to take the next two or three days off. This was a tough session. This that went well, you handled it well, but take three days off. And, it's, it's hard, right? You, I am of the mindset that if some is good, more has got to be better. <laughs> right. And it's not with, it's not with dogs, right? You know, and it's not even with people. You can, you can run yourself into the ground and, um, it's, you got to see the, the value in those breaks. As long as they're, they're not too much. You can't take six months off and expect no. to have grown somehow, but a couple days here and there is, is good. Yeah, absolutely. What are some of the other considerations or factors in your opinion that people should be aware of or just consider in general when they're kind of developing their spring or year long training plans? Um, for me, I think that, um, we do judge based off of, eh, so I think the biggest thing that I would look at, let's go with this. I think the biggest thing that I would be looking at is trying to get a visual, and maybe it's just because I'm a visual learner type person, but try and get a visual of what you ultimately are shooting for. So if you say, I want this retrieved hand, and I want to do advanced marks, I want my dog to be steadier, meaning they break at wing, but I don't have to nag them and woe them and things like that, or taking it to a next level. I feel like personally steady to shot is a difficult thing to maintain because it's, it's inconsistent as the shooter is not watching the dog when they're shooting, which the shooter often is the handler when it comes to hunting time. So that can slide pretty quickly, but if you go to this next level and you say, I want my dog to do this rather than just hear about it or think you want this, go, go see what these things are like, find some way to, to be able to visualize what your goals are and then go, yeah, I really do want that. And then be able to lay out what are the steps I need to take to get there. And you're going to need a resource, whether that is asking here or, you know, reaching out to, somebody at a local club or reaching out to a professional, you need a resource that can help you to say, do these things X, Y, and Z, and then give you guidance along the way. I mean, that's, it's invaluable really. Yeah. Just, just having that 
phone a friend option in your pocket. Like, oh man, this dog really threw me for a loop or, you know, did I ruin my dog? Should I just go ahead and sell them? Like, it's just, sometimes yeah. you, you need that grounding. I mean, sometimes you just need that sounding board. We all do just to, you know, you have cat that I'm probably sure that you sound some things off of her and vice versa. And, you know, I got my buddies to where I'm like, man, I completely jacked this session up. What do you, what do you think? You know, we all need that sounding board. Yeah, I, I mean, we have an entire team here at the the kennel that is why we can do what we do and and turn out as dogs that are as nice as what they are. Um, you know, Jessica is the the head trainer out here. She does ninety nine percent of the dogs that come through the training program. Um, Charles trains and tests our dogs and and runs the the ranch program. He um, does most of our Navda testing. One of my biggest strengths and, and most experience in category, I run all of our dogs through the AKC hunt tests. And um, I am not good at giving the dogs enough freedom to excel at the Navda utility test. So anytime I run utility tests, I've got just a little too much of them under my thumb. They don't make mistakes, but they don't expand as well as they need to from a duck search standpoint or mm. you know some of those other kind of things I, i've got a lot of uh, uh of threes and duck searches so it's and and that's something that's why i'm really good at running hunt tests and he's really good at building that relationship that he can do both and um the field work sometimes slides just a little bit but it's still within the, the realms of not perfect, but fits to get prize ones, which is why, you know, it's, it's a difference. And then you add um, Tessa run is Jess's like full-time assistant. She does all of the obedience work on top of the uh, field work. Those dogs are getting, she's repping all of that and making sure that they're sharp before they go home. And so um, not to mention having all of those pieces make our machine run, but when I'm struggling with something, I have multiple resources that I can say, here, why don't you work on this for a little while? And when you are by yourself, you need to be able to say to your training buddy or whatever, um, whoever it is that you're working with, hey, why don't you do a few reps here? And we, you probably heard good cop, bad cop, but it's not necessarily <laughs> that. It's just like a, it's a fresh look. And sometimes that's all it takes to get over humps and then you can go back to what you were doing. And it took me a while. I and mean, be honest, I'm a, a pretty prideful person. Like, Oh yeah, I can do this. I don't need nobody's <laughs> help, whatever. And it's, um, being able to move past that and, and view how extremely beneficial a team is and a, a network of people to work with and train with is it's, really invaluable in that hitting those bumps in the road um, happens a lot that uh, Jessica will say, Hey, I need help with this one little pickup and I'll do one set, like literally one session and that's it. And You're then, a wizard. <laughs> you I'm did it. Wizard, in one. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's not that it's that sometimes too, it can be, there needs to be a little bit of a push in there and it's better if it comes from, somebody else that won't have um, emotional attachment well that the dog won't have to hold it again there you go there yeah. is some of that right so not that that's a common thing but there is all but it does happen on occasion um the other side of it is just having not even bad things just having that many people to bounce dogs around and say you can have the exact same expectation. Um, our verbiage is the same. Our handling mannerisms are the same. We work as a machine, and we 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 all won. <laughs> it, but uh, all, all kidding aside, it is important that it's it's very very similar, but it's different. And the, the dogs recognize it's a different person. But everything can I can take any one of the dogs in there, and I know. If she says they know X, Y, and Z, I know how to handle them. Yeah. So it's um, it's cool. It's, yeah. uh, it's really cool. Well, and everybody has their strengths and weaknesses, but there's also sure. – you know, everybody hears that all the time. But just through that, 
lens and, and our background and what we're good at or poor at, we also have different perspectives. And maybe she's seen something on a dog in previous reps that you haven't and vice versa to where it's sometimes how many times have you been in that the shoes to where you were the wizard in that one example, but she's been the wizard before to where it's just like, you know, she comes out there, snaps her hands in a certain, you know, way, standing on the left leg and looking to the right, whatever, and the dog just jumps too and you're like oh man like how, how, why didn't i think of that and it, it's just sometimes that's what back to what you were talking about earlier in the groups and navda training days yeah you can go out there there's a lot of opinions out there but there's also you know that's just knowledge to be acquired right just soak it all up and that doesn't mean that go apply everything that everybody does but just go out there and watch and pay attention and learn what you don't want just as much as what you do want. And uh, yeah. just, just you know, no no going in that everybody is there going to, they are going to try and help you the best way they know how, which is to talk about how they train. So just kind of take everything with a grain of salt. And if it makes sense, use it. If it doesn't, don't. Well, and, and their experience might be based off of, um, three to five dogs mm -hmm. kind of deal. And though they've taken them to high levels, they know how to accomplish goals with that specific dog, with that specific mindset or trainability or, or whatever it may be. And um, it takes a lot of dogs to be able to know how to apply different things to different dogs. We don't have a training method. We have a, a bag of tricks and we have a general path in which we follow, but experience is what, what allows us to read that it's what it's what you dance around this stuff but i don't want to i don't want to paint some path right um well if you get in the habit yeah if you get in the habit of telling everybody like here's the 10 steps they don't deviate from those 10 steps and, and so again you know it goes back to what i was talking about earlier like there's so much context built into all of these situations that you can't cover everything in a very clean and succinct, just step-by-step -step manual. I know that's what everybody wants, but you just, you can't do it when you're dealing with, you know, live animals, you know, both us and the dogs. It just, it doesn't work that way. 100% correct. So you mentioned Charles and the ranch program. I want to I want to dig into the ranch thing before we wrap this up because it seems like from afar you guys have really kind of hit a stride this year from what I've seen from afar and like what you guys are building down there. What what are what is the goal down there? I know that you got some pretty unique things going on there with completely steady pointers mixing with some flushing dogs and cockers and now they're doing nab to test down there. Kind of tell me what's going on in that compound down in Texas. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, it's a private ranch, um, El Tesoro, and we are running a running and developing a string of dogs for them. So it's, um, we work together on the whole process and they are, um, if you could say these words and apply them to a dog co-branded, um, <laughs> they say, uh, standing stone and El Tesoro in the name. And these are dogs being bred kept and and developed for for that program specifically which is to hunt quail they're developing the wild bird they have good numbers um i'm probably not exactly accurate on this but on the five thousand acres they counted i think roughly 200 some cubbies of quail and it's a lot um but most of south texas is difficult to navigate so they had to clear a ton of ground and bring back more what is natural south texas habitat which is moths and cactus and light thin grass but they like the just a, anybody that hasn't been down there um imagine a 10 foot tall scrubby tree with thorns on it and then make that a completely thick wall because the branches start at about uh i don't know 10 or 12 inches off the ground and then that is that's it it's just this giant wall of this super thick either black brush or mesquite or there's a whole bunch of them mixed in with that different brushy type stuff and it just makes this super super thick area so they went through and 
um, roller chopped, which is a giant steam rolly wheel with fins on it that roll over the cover and break it into small pieces. And they cleared, I think, 1,200 acres mm. um, to build these zones that are huntable quail cover. The quail are out there. You just can't get to them. So the combination between the two, they have uh, three currently three, about 50-acre bird fields that are planted birds, and you get to experience that. They do it in 10 bird cubbies, and it's, uh, it is a morning shoot, and it is a lot of fun. The dogs stand steady, and we utilize cockers to flush birds. Um, it's really, really, really cool to watch. And the wild bird aspect of things, wild birds, are they flush on their own. We don't involve the cockers in that game. It's you walk up on the point, the birds go. And I got to, I mean, we hunted an hour and a half or two hours and moved like seven coveys, and putzing around you know texas style on a on a buggy dogs are out hunting <laughs> swap them as they go you know so it's um it's a it's a really cool it's a really cool experience and so the dogs in the program that we're developing down there have been able to offer the things like hosting the test out there they were gracious enough to allow the grounds to be used for that and um so anybody that's down in that area, I know that they're always looking for volunteers. May reach out to the chapter that we don't know what it's named. <laughs> so you can put that in the notes. Yeah. Um, but that's it, man. That's what we're doing. Um, we're just we're developing a string of dogs to to run for them down there on some pen raised birds and and some wild birds, mm. all quail, all quail. That's pretty cool. I'm assuming that they just reached out to you and threw up a crazy idea, or did it did his kind of meeting of the minds just opportunistically just kind of came up with this concept because it's pretty unique. I, I can't recall anybody else that kind of has a, a a relationship with like a private ranch preserve, whatever the heck you call it, uh, situation. Yeah, it's um, I got an email that came through the store's contact form that our shipping manager forwarded on to me and I saw it and was like, we'd like you to come to our ranch and I'd have to look and see the exact email, but it was worded like, check out our Facebook page. We're a legitimate thing. Like, I don't want you to feel like this is spam. I'm like, you saying that makes me feel more like it's spam. <laughs> and I go, <laughs> I go and look and they, I mean, they're not a, it's like, say it's a private ranch. They don't have a big, social following they don't have a bunch of videos of anything else and it's like a handful of pictures of dead deer and he's like i i don't understand what this is but uh sure i'll give you a call and i call and talk to the guy and that's lane grigsby um super super nice guy he said i just want you to come down and and look at what we have and and consult i've i've seen your youtube videos and ultimately what uh, drew his attention was the fact that I had a pink gun. Like that's what I was like, this, <laughs> who is this kid? So he starts watching more things and goes, maybe so he looks and he's like, I like the way that he's doing stuff. And they had, um, been doing some hunts down there, but had fairly green dogs or less obedient dogs and things. And he said, I, I want to do something better than this, which is, is the way they do everything on the ranch. They have a deer breeding program. Um, you know, South Texas ranch style, they have the, the pasture, which is all as fair chase as you can have inside a, um, a high fence. The deer are raised out there. It's not like they dumped out a 200 inch deer and said, go shoot it. They're, they're raised on the, on the farm and all of those things. So it's, um, but the, the breeding pins are top notch. They have bass fishing ponds. I mean, everything that's done, it's like, how do we do this the best? that you can do it. And that's what he said. Can, how can we make this the best? And I said, well, I, I think if we have dogs that do this and we run the hunts this way with releasing birds rather than dizzying them in sacks and whatever, like it can happen at different quail hunting things. I said, I think it will provide an experience that, that people don't get to experience often. So, yeah. um, and it's, uh, it's been fun. It's they're really really good people. It's been great people to work with, and uh, as we continue to build out the dogs, 
this first couple of years, it was primarily my personal dogs, but this next year will be the first year. This will be our third season and starting here in 24, November 1st will be the third season down there and will be the first year that El Tesoro named dogs um, are oh, on the ranch, ranch, which will be cool. Yeah, yeah no, yeah. that's... That's cool. I'll, uh, if anybody's interested in checking it out, I'll throw the El Tesoro link as well as that NAVDA chapter link down in the show notes if they're curious. Yes, but, if, we can, uh, if we can figure out what it's called. If, right. Yeah. If we can remember the names. Uh, well, I mean, since the last time we've had you on the podcast, Ethan, I've started doing something on all these episodes uh, to kind of wrap this up and close it out to kind of let the guests kind of take this wherever they want to do it. And so my last question is always now coming up as what's something I should have asked you in this conversation that I didn't. Huh? Um, maybe the only thing I would say is where are we going hunting this year since we didn't get to make it la happen last year? I don't know, man. I was planning on talking to you about that at, at Pheasant Fest. And, and again, this will come out after Pheasant Fest. But yeah, I was I had that on my list because, you know, that was something I know we we had a couple dates and, and penciled in throughout the year. And, you know, it, one got canceled after the next for life you know, uh, busy, yes. busy stuff. And, uh, but that is something that, that we need to figure out and actually, you know, instead of putting it down in pencil, put it down in, in ink this time before, Absolutely. before the calendars get filled up. I mean, it's, uh, I, it's that time of year where I'm starting to consider and think about what trip or adventure I want to go on this year. Up until now, I've kind of been like, you know, I just got home and don't even want to think about the hunting stuff, but it's already, uh, it's, it's barely March pretty much. And I'm already starting to think like, all right, where do I want to go? That wanderlust is starting to creep back up in me. <laughs> it does not take long. Yeah. It does not take long. Yeah. Well, uh, we'll, we'll figure that out in Pheasant Fest. We'll, we'll cover that offline, but man, I, you know, I definitely uh, appreciate you hopping on and talking general, you know, dog training and, and planning and, your hunting season recap sounded like you had a good one and, and like we just covered it. I'll look forward to linking back up again this upcoming season and making actually something happen this year. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, awesome.